Jeopardy here tonight, helping to run the sound. It's good to know how to do everything. Can you say amen? Well, it's good to be in church tonight. This is a wonderful time of the year. And uh, it's uh, always did say that it was good to have Thanksgiving before Christmas, a holiday. Because it gives us a time to be thankful and show the Lord and show our friends and show our relatives. And, and we're going to get opportunity this week, I'm sure all of you will, to be able to be with uh, one or more of the members of your family and be able to tell them how much you care about them and, and, uh, and how much you love them. It's also a time to look forward to uh, the virgin birth the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. And uh, it won't be long after, after this week that everything will begin to turn and uh, things are turning right now. You wanna just wait a minute? You'll wait, won't you? You should have much, no choice, do you? <laughs> Praise the Lord, okay. We're back and uh, I'll let them adjust that a little bit there. They're getting a ring, aren't we? Pretty bad ring, so. Brother John's going to fix that for me, and we're going to be back in shape. Praise the Lord. This is a great time because uh, it lets, praise the Lord, it lets, uh, it lets us begin to think at the end of this week about, again, one of the most precious times of the year, and that is the Christmas season. And uh, in our church, we go to great lengths to, to recognize that time of the year. Amen. Praise God. Brother John, you're working on it, aren't you? Good. Okay, we're going to let him work with that a little bit. Tonight, if you have your Bibles, I would like for you to turn with me this evening to two portions of Scripture. And... Uh, I know this morning, uh, it, was a, it was a very busy service, and uh, I felt like it was very busy, and it was my fault as well as uh, because of where we all planned it, but uh, I trust that even with all the scripture this morning that you got something out of the sermon, because, because I believe that serving the Lord is a tremendously important, serious thing. And a lot of times people have come to me and said, Pastor, Everything went well until I started doing something for the Lord. And as soon as I started doing something for the Lord, then everything seemed to go bad. How many's ever had that happen? And the more I do for God, the worse it gets. Well, I want you to know, folks, that this is a battle we're in. All the time on this earth, and maybe we don't always hear it in, in the church. And uh, thank God for the times of reveling in the presence of God and, and praising the Lord ecstatically. But ladies and gentlemen, sometime we've got to come down to earth and we have to realize that we've got to walk the walk and talk the talk. And that means do battle with the enemy and prepare ourselves to face the enemy sometime in our life before we leave this world where Jesus comes, everybody in this church will have to face the enemy and deal with his tactics. In these texts tonight, uh, I heard Brother Kennedy when he was praying and he, he confirmed this message. The entitlement of my message is One More Step Toward the End. My first text is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, reading from the King James Version. And then when I go back to one verse out of Matthew chapter 24, which would be verse 4. I heard Brother Kennedy when he's praying refer, and I've also heard the Holy Spirit say this so often in the last few weeks, which has somehow put it in my heart that it's important that we learn the Word of God and that we know the Word and that we value the Word, and that we know where we stand in the Word of God. That is so, so very important. And tonight's message deals with exactly that in these last days. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. 
For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I'd like to stop there just a moment. I think this is probably another redundant statement, something you've heard and heard and heard over and over again. But I think it needs restating. I believe that when people suffer, they get closer to God. How many believe that? They get closer to God. And I'll tell you something, folks. That's what, that's what Peter was saying here. Let me read it again to you. Uh, for as much then, verse 1, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. In other words, get it in your head. The way he suffered, you will suffer. Now, our society doesn't, even in the church, we don't want to talk about things like this. I know in the new charismatic movement, uh, I had a lady stand up in a church that I pastored and said that St. Paul was not right with God. He couldn't have been right with God. Or he wouldn't have suffered as much as he did. He could have, should have been able to speak the word and all that leave. And he walked in utopia into the presence of God. That's not what the word teaches. And I know we don't want to consistently stand in the pulpit or otherwise and preach a pessimistic message. But ladies and gentlemen, this thing has to be balanced. I believe that as we praise Him, and you have done that in your testimonies tonight, without going through the fire, you would have no testimony. You'd have no testimony unless you first go through the fire, go through the flood, go through the battle, and thank God, win! That's what it's all. This young lady that just come back to the Lord, thank God, she's won! Can you say amen? She's finally won! Praise the Lord. That's what makes her broken. That's what makes her humble in the presence of the Lord. Mister, that gives you a testimony when you know, if you love me, Jesus said, you will also suffer with me. Verse 2. That he should no longer should live uh, the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, in lusts, in excess of wine, in revelings, and banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them, once you become a Christian, you stop those kinds of things. Am I correct? You don't do those things anymore. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead that they might be judged according to men to the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Mark verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity, fervent love among yourselves. For love or charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And I stop with verse 11. If any man speak, this is a very, very important scripture, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Turn back with me, Matthew 24, verse 4, a very short scripture, but filled with powerful meaning. Here's what it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just covet your presence. 
On this message tonight, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of coming to this place of worship. Thank you for all of these dear folks. Lord, we ask you to bless them and may your word find its lodging and cause us to grow even deeper. In just a little while, we're going to gather in an old-fashioned way. We're just going to come around these altars and bury our heads in the altar, and we're going to seek you, Lord. I pray the Holy Ghost will come down and minister to us in this prayer meeting as never before. Oh, God, may the holiness of God be seen through his word even this evening, we pray. Make me, Lord, your servant. Humbly, I ask you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody has written the Bible. It's the charter of all true liberty, the forerunner of civilization. It is the motor of institutions and of governments. It's the fashioner of law. It's the secret of national progress. It's the guide of history. It's the ornament and mainspring of literature. It's the friend of science. It's the inspiration of philosophies. It's the textbook of ethics. It's the light of intellect. It's the answer to the deepest human heart and its hungerings. It's the soul of all strong heart life. It's the illuminator of darkness, the foe of superstition, the enemy of oppression, the uprooter of sin, the regulator of all high and worthy standards, it's the comfort in sorrow. It's the strength in weakness. It's the pathway in perplexity. It's the escape from temptation. It's the steadier in the day of power. It's the embodiment of all lofty ideals. It's the beginner of life and the promise of the future, the star of this night, the revealer of God. And last, the Bible. It's the guide and hope and inspiration of mankind. That's the Bible. Praise the Lord. In 1973, it's been quite a while back, an announcement was made February the 3rd in bold type. A long cherished dream, finally, a common Bible has been completed. This statement by Emily V. Gibbs, an executive of the National Council of Churches, its general acceptance marks one more step, ladies and gentlemen. Even though it was in 1973, there are some translations to the Bible today. I won't go into them and I won't name them, but I'll tell you folks, there are some translations that are coming out in God's Word that are atrocious. They have no biblical basis. They have taken the value of holiness and solid doctrine right out of the Word. And I, and I think in this last day we need to caution ourselves to remember the importance of the Bible as we know the Bible. You say, well, Pastor, is it, a, is it a sin if you read anything else but the King James Version? I, I wouldn't say that. I, I know in old times people thought the King James Version was the only Bible. But ladies and gentlemen, the King James Version was translated just like the NIV. It's a translation from the original Hebrew or the original Greek. And that's what the NIV does. It's what the Hebrew Bible does. It's what the, 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 I can't think of them now, but that's what a lot of different versions have in their basis for what they say. But I, I'm teaching on the cults, and, and uh, I could name to you some Bibles, but for instance, in, in the, uh, the, the study that we have in the cults right now on Wednesday nights, and we'll be studying on that the last Wednesday night of this month again, the, the, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not only do they carry around the Holy Bible, the King James Version, but they live by their own version of their Bible. And my Bible seems to tell me that we must be cautious not to add to it or take away from it. 
Now, you say, Pastor, I don't know anybody in this church that's ever wrote more than what's in the Bible uh, than what's right there. No, I don't either. I've never met anybody personally that has done that. But I, I'm going to say something that I think to be true. I think every day in the lives of men and women and young people, the Bible is being rewritten day after day after day after day and added to it things that ought not to be there. We may not write it, but we live it. Or we don't live it. And thus, I believe it's just as easy to add to God's Word or take away from God's Word by our actions. I like my mother used to say, I say, Mom, I'm going to do it. She'd say, you know, after the 15th time of telling me, Actions speak louder than words. My mother used to use that term on me all the time. Actions, some speak louder than words. I think that same approach comes to us as believers and Christians of the Christian church. I believe it's time, like I said before, it's an old cliche. Walk the walk and talk the talk. I can't say I've always done that. I'm glad I'm not running for president. You'd find out some stuff about me you wouldn't like. Today I stand not proudly, and I say with every ounce of strength within this being, I'm trying to walk the walk and I'm trying to talk the talk. I'm trying to do God's will in my personal life. I'm trying to be the pastor He wants me to be. And uh, I'll tell you something, folks, I don't want to add to this word, nor do I ever want to take away from it. This common Bible that came out in 1973, I read a portion of it. And the wordology, and has anybody else ever had one of those? Anybody ever see it? No one saw it. But I'll tell you, the terminology in that common Bible is just so atrocious and so common that it has no firm basics for holiness. It's something which the church somehow is losing. I believe this marks the beginning of the end, ladies and gentlemen. There will never, ever be a common Bible. Ever. You say, well, that was just terminology, Pastor. I don't care. I don't think we should even use the terminology. There is no such thing as a common Bible. It is God's Word. It is His Holy Word. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you of a few things about this Word in these last days. First of all, I believe that it's not common, but it's holy commandments. It is holy commandments. And Jesus thought it so important that He said, don't you look for miracles in your life until you first obey My commandments. Jesus taught it over and over again. Someone has said, He answered, I'm afraid the Bible is true. And if I could know for certain that death is an eternal sleep, I should be happy. My joy would be complete. But here is the thorn that stings me. This is the word that pierces my very soul. If the Bible is true, then unless I change, I am lost forever. I think, ladies and gentlemen, sounds morbid maybe, but I think, I think somehow some of the truth of God's word has died in the church. We need to bring it alive. Oh, yes, yes. We need to bring it alive. Romans 7, 12. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good. And we need to remember that. God's word is forever settled. Praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul was instructing this, this young preacher that was getting ready to sort of take over the reins and go out into the field and look after the churches as it were for Paul who was about to lose his head. He said all scripture. Tim? I don't know if you call him Tim, but... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness. 
that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to us in the service this morning in the interpretation. I don't know whether you caught it, but I did. I don't often forget interpretations to messages and tongues. And one of the statements that was made was, make us perfect in you. That was the exact words that were brought out in that message of interpretation. Oh God, help us through the word to become perfect people in the power of God. How could I ever achieve it, Pastor Tomlinson? I don't know other than live it. Live it. Let's get back to the principles that made the church what it is. And live it. Number two. I believe this book is not man's design. This is what our this is what our professors say. And you know it's just getting it's getting worse and worse. I, I get so upset and it's hard for me to read documentaries anymore, especially by philosophers because because they're just teaching uh, erroneous things and things that are not doctrinally sound about Jesus Christ and about the word. We know that archaeology is beginning to substantiate the Word of God, and I look at uh, I look at Brother Bill, and he was with me in Israel, and I don't know if anybody else would have been. I know Brother Craver was in Israel, and maybe some other folks, and John was in Israel, and, and, and some of those folks. But I remember they showed us some sites and, and some things that have been uncovered that verified that the Word of God is true that was written thousands of years ago. And people say it's nothing more than a message of a man. He just wrote a story. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, my second point is this book is not man's design but it is holy and divine let us remember that and preach it and live it and speak it never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God hallelujah what did, how's the rest of it go unto salvation to everyone who believeth 2nd Peter 121 says for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Someone has said, study the Bible to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. How true, how true that is. I know people who read the Bible through, some of them several times a year. I think that is wonderful. I think you should read the Bible through as often as you can and consistently as you can. But ladies and gentlemen, there are people that simply read the Bible through uh, systematically so they can say they've done it and they can't comprehend it and they can't keep it in their mind. It's just another page in, in the book. I want you to know when you look at this Bible, it jumps out at you. Now this morning, you know what worried me? I'm talking too fast, I know, but I'm trying to hurry so we can go to prayer. This morning what worried me was that I read so much scripture. But I'll tell you folks, that word that I read, it was pictorial. It was in design uh, a little bit rough, I'll tell you. But I, I assimilated that, that scripture from that sermon this morning, those texts into my heart to where I was reading those scriptures. I was reading those scriptures. I found myself reliving being on that hill facing Goliath. I could hear the chatter of the chariots and the, and the roar of the horses. Uh, and I could hear the clang of the, steel, of the steel armor. I could hear that in my mind. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll never know the reality of God's Word until you do that. Am I right? Until you can literally almost relive it. I learned something new about service through this message I preached this morning. And that is, Jesus, I'm going to walk the line. And I'm not going to the left or the right. I may become unpopular, but I'm going to do what I know is right. I'm not going to be intimidated by people. And I'm not going to be flamboyant about it. I don't think I need to stand up there and say, I want you to go. I don't need to do that. Just quietly preach the gospel and live it. And lead this church that way. Am I right? God has spoke to me many times and said, Fred, those who want to follow will follow. 
Boy, God's Word, how important it is. It's not a man's philosophy. Listen to me. Listen to me tonight. Number three, uh, and by the way, if you want to put this in your notes, the Word of God, it cannot be improved upon. <laughs> People are trying to do that all the time. They're trying to improve on it. You can improve on the Word of God. You can take an uncouth man. You can take a man that, that doesn't have any education and he can stand up. And if the power of the Holy Ghost comes on him and he learned one verse. John 3.16 and says it under the influence of the Holy Ghost. People will run against him. Because you don't have to add to the Word. You don't have to take away from the Word. It's already forever settled. Number three, this book is not common. And this is another mark of the last days. The Bible seems to be one of the last things that's done in services today. I don't mean our church, thank God. Uh, we have a good mixture here. But I'll tell you something, folks. I hear more complaints. I've been a presbyter. I hear more complaints about what pastors are saying or what people are saying. And pastors especially are saying that there is, there is just so much other stuff and there's not very much time given to the Word and the pastor doesn't preach 15, 20 minutes and everything else is taken up in flamboyant stuff. Folks, you can't live a victorious life without the Word. You can't do it. You may go a while, but it won't last forever. If you don't base your life on this gospel, then you'll not make it. You will not make it. You see, this book is not common. This book is not meant to be merely for scholars. Number three, but it is for, but it is a holy spiritual message to every person who will hear. Romans 7 and verse 14. For we know that the law, or in this case we could call it the word, for we know that the word is spiritual. And Paul said this to the Romans. He said, but I am carnal. I'm sold under sin. You can't compare me to this Bible. You can't compare me to that. This word is holy and righteous. But if you look at me, I'm a downright sinner, lost and undone without God, but by that word. That's how I got saved, Mr. the Lord. That's how I got saved. That word burned my spirit and convicted my soul. And I heard that word preached, and I couldn't stay away from that old. Until I gave my life to Jesus. That's that word. Without it, our lives are empty. Victor Hugo said this. Englishman. England has two books. The Bible and Shakespeare. England made Shakespeare, but the Bible made England. Amen. Isn't that the truth? You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Most of the preaching, power of preaching and evangelism that we have heard over the years came from England. 99% came from the country of England. Powerful evangelists came out of that country. Anointed men of God. Moved by the Holy Ghost. Spurgeon. I could go on. I can't, I can't remember. I, for some reason tonight, uh, I'm not ticking. I'm ticking. I'm not thinking. Uh, praise the Lord. Don't be too quiet or I think I'm not living. Okay. First Corinthians. Chapter 2 and verse 14. I love to preach on the Word. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I once lived with a man. My, my stepfather. who He knew the Bible. He could argue the Bible with any preacher. But he wasn't saved. And you see, folks, without the Spirit of God, that's why the same Spirit that illuminates the Word and causes us to accept Christ as Savior and grow doctrinally in the Word as Christians is the same Holy Ghost that inspired this Word to be written. 
It's a book of saving grace. The Bible, it's a book of direction to meet man's needs. There's not a need that you have that the Bible doesn't have an answer for. Amen. I want you to remember that. And I think we have put the Bible in number five or six down the list. Thank God for our Christian psychologists and all these great people. But I'll tell you folks, we need to put the Bible back up on number one. Because a lot of the things that are going on in our troubles, in our homes, and in our lives, we can fix if we go to this Word. That's true. Because it has answers for us. Number four. Talking about this great book, the Bible. This book is not merely a story of events, but God's Word forever settled. Forever settled in heaven. A skeptic in London recently said in speaking of the Bible that it was quite impossible in these days to believe in any book whose author was unknown. A Christian asked him if the compiler of the multiplication table was known. No, he answered. And the other guy answered, then of course you don't believe in it either. <laughs> you know, you, can't, you, can, you can argue about these things all day. We can stand and, and refute things. People can come up with all types of philosophies. But it comes down to the very point of our faith in God somewhere along the line. And I know this sounds maybe just a little bit shallow, but I don't mean for it to. I, I believe in this Bible for two reasons. Number one, because what it says, something through it has done something to me. That changes the course of how I believe in it. Secondly, it may sound foolish to you, but I haven't found, if this is right to say, I haven't found any other book I want to believe in. There are books everywhere, Christian books by Christian writers. I love to read them, but they don't do anything for me. I mean that. I can read those books, and they don't move my spirit. But when I open this book, it moves me. Forms by inner man. It's inspired. It's God's word. Praise God. I've not found anything else. This is it. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight there is no question about its intent. There is no question about the power of of the Word of God. Number five, speaking about the beginning of the end, and I see it happening in our country, and I know maybe you don't want, some of you wouldn't want me to say it, I'll say it anyway. We're living in just an awful period of time right now, as far as I'm concerned. Our country has lost all respect for its leadership. We don't know who we believe in or who we trust if we trust anybody. We almost don't know what party we belong to. Or whether we want to belong to it. And now the courts are ruling our country, telling our country what it can do about votes, or about a president. And all we do is stand and watch, and wonder what's going to happen next. I want you to know, folks, you look up and you look up good. Because somebody said, oh, we got to get the right man in. Yes, I'd love to have the right man, whoever he may be. But I'll tell you this right now. I, I say this from the depths of my heart. Things are not going to get any better. According to the Word of God, they're going to get worse and worse and worse. And things in a nation and the world cannot get worse until they first have bad leadership. That a man will arise. He'll holler and cry around the world over the TV and across the internet. Peace, peace to the world. The whole world will turn to them and many will follow. Now you look around you, sir, lady. And we're living toward the end. I preached a message on Israel. That's not my last one either. I'm making another one right now. But that one I preached a few weeks ago on Israel, that's just the beginning of a series whenever the Lord lays them on my heart to preach. 
I believe, and, and I heard it again in the prayer of our brother, I'll tell you something, folks. You look around a little bit. Time is short. I don't care what they say. Time is short. Jesus, if he doesn't come back, this world's going to explode. It's not going to be able to stand the tension that that sin is placing upon it. We don't know who to trust. And that's exactly the atmosphere that has to come about, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just in the United States of the world. In the United States, it's around the world. People don't know who they can trust as a leader. Somebody must rise up and say, I'll lead you. I think that time is short right now. What's going to keep the church straight? Is it going to be watching? Nothing against I do it too. I watch Channel 4. What else is going to happen pertaining to the election? It just, uh, it's frustrating to me, but a bit interesting. And uh, we watch it. We think what's going to happen next. I want you to know something, folks. Every time something like this, and it's going to be more and more and more and more, more and more unstable. Everything is going to become more unstable. You're not going to be able to count on your money. I don't want to scare you, but I'm telling you, folks, I'm telling you right now, it's going to come to the point it will all be one currency. It will have to because every other currency in the world will lose its very foundation. And it's coming to that now. One of the strongest financial nations in the world, Japan, is frustratingly trying to keep her head above water. She is ready to sink right now, economically. What does it point to? It points to what the Bible, that Bible's already warned us of what's coming. One currency, one way to be sure you get money to pay. Here's another thing, and I'm, I'm going down a road I shouldn't be on, but, uh, well, I should be, but it's not my sermon. I just, I, uh, Ruth Ann Renner, the poor girl, trying to find oil, Ran out of oil. Couldn't hardly find anybody to sell her any. The government says that there's a shortage. It's all political. I'm sorry. And what is it leading to? It's leading to the point where you have to have a mark. Or you can't buy fuel, Ruth Ann. To a point where you won't be here, thank God. You won't have to worry about it. Your furnace will be idle. Unless somebody else moves into the house. Thank God the church is going out before then. But it's coming to the point very closely when you'll not be able to buy fuel for your heat. You'll not be able to go to the store and buy food. You won't be able to buy milk for your baby or clothes or, or anything else. Unless you have the mark of the beast, you can't do it. And the Bible says once you take the mark of the beast, you are damned eternal. You can never be saved, ever. So what am I saying? The only thing that's going to keep the church straight, ladies and gentlemen, and make us ready for the rapture, which thank God we're on this side of the rapture. I'm glad I'm not on the other side. Amen. Aren't you? Amen. Amen. The only thing that's going to keep the church ready is to live by that unadulterated word. That's all. If we go anywhere else, we're going to get caught up in this mess in our society, and we're going to unravel. And we'll all be on value. Am I preaching the truth? Amen. It's not fables. It's fact. Matthew 5.18 says these words. For verily I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law or from the word properly interpreted till all be fulfilled. That's how important the Bible is to all of us. It's God's precepts. He's laid down foundations for us to live by. It's God's prophecies. How do we know anything about the future? It's because God allowed the prophecies of old to come our way through men of God, anointed by the Holy Ghost, who could foresee through the message of the Holy Ghost and the power of Jesus Christ what is yet to come. 
And by the way, write this in your notes. The Bible is not your property, and it's not my property. It's his property. We're not to meddle with it. It's not ours to meddle with. Am I correct? Number six. My last point. Someone has said the Bible doesn't have to be rewritten. It just needs to be reread. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's almost as simple as simple. But uh, the Bible doesn't need to be rewritten. It just needs to be reread. I need to, I, I need to learn how to assimilate God's word into my being so I can live it again. Isn't that great? So I can learn to live the Bible, live the word in my life. Last but not least, the Bible does not teach dead tradition, but living faith. Praise God. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. 1 Peter chapter 1. Here's what it says, beginning with verse 22. 22 through 25. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with, with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the, here it is, you can't even be saved without the Word of God. It's impossible. You can't go out here. People say you can, but you can't. You cannot get saved without first hearing the truth. Being born again, not of incorruptible seed, but of, but, uh, of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Verse 25, mark it in your Bible. But the Word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. God's Word. That's why I'm here tonight. That's why I'm your pastor. I say that you say, boy, preacher, you're lying through your teeth. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here to make money. I'm not here to make a name for myself. And I mean that before God Almighty. I am here because I have no other desire than to preach and share this Word. And see people come to the same Jesus I love and know Him as their Savior also. That's the only desire I have in the world. That's the only desire. You ask my wife every Christmas. She comes to me. What do you want, honey, for Christmas? And I say, well, give me some time. And I think, you know, although I already know the multitude of things she wants. And I, uh, I'm just kidding. And uh, she'll come back to me. Honey, have you made up your mind? What do you need? I said, honey, I can't find a thing I need. I don't need nothing. How about them pants got holes in them? That same shirt you wear week after week. <laughs> Nobody else does stuff like that. I said, honey, I, I don't, I really don't. I just don't require much. I'm a happy individual. I get tense sometimes. Serious, under stress. But underneath, uh, believe it or not, I'm a fairly happy guy. <laughs> Why is that? I found the happiness. I'm here being your pastor and very humbled by it because God saw fit in His Word to save me and to call me and place me over this flock to help make us ready for His soon coming. Serving God isn't getting your needs met. Serving God is showing Him love living by His Word. Your needs being met and all the other things that come are just the blessings that God brings on top of that. Tonight, I just, I just want to close with this. We got our traditional way of saying things in the church and I want to bypass that. I just want to say this. If everybody under the sound of my voice tonight and just a, just a percentage of our churches here 
We'll just endeavor from this point on to take God's word out. And every time you read it, try to eat it. Try to live it. Try to get it so close into your life that, that uh, you know, there's times, and I know, I'm a creative guy in a sense, I, I've never created anything. But uh, I, I am in a sense got a great sense of, uh, what, what does Joyce call it? Uh, Joyce says I, I have a, a good something. Uh, when, you can, when you can do things through your mind, make up things, create things, what do you call that? Imagination. That's what Joyce, Joyce says, Pastor, you have a wonderful imagination. <coughs> She'd say, I've never seen a person who could have a funeral sermon together in three seconds. So I never saw anybody do that before until I met you. And uh, you know, you've got to have an imagination to serve God. I don't know whether you believe that, I do. How can I ever know God in this fullness if I can't imagine myself walking with Him? If I can't imagine being in a place where He was when He walked into Mary's supper? They were out of line. And they were frustrated and said, All we must do is get wine! Jesus, in his miracle touch, turned the water into new wine. You see, it's good. You can almost hear the people praising, Oh man! And the reveling and, and the marriage continuing. All because of the touch of the Master's hand. The little lady that was bleeding and dying. I tried every physician and couldn't find an answer. I could hear the crowd. I don't know about you, but when I read that scripture, I can hear the people pressing. I can hear them breathing. I can feel the heat of their bodies, and I'm crawling on the ground, trying to get through their legs and just touch the hem of this stranger who is saying words that just excite my inner person. When he speaks, I feel tingling in my body. When he speaks out, a whole bunch of people stopped talking and they listened to him intriguingly. And then I touch his clothes. And when I touch his clothes, something quits running inside me. And that heat that's been saturating the trunk of my inner body stops. And that blood flow is healed. I feel a new energy come into my body. And I hear him turn and say, Who touched me? And the disciples say, How in the world could you say that, Master? People are all around you. He said, Because virtue flowed from me. By his stripes, we are healed. And maybe you think all oh, that's goofy. That's the way I love to relive the life. That's the way I love to relive it. And the more I do that, the more real Jesus becomes to me. How many can say amen? amen. Would you stand with me? Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have an old prayer meeting. I'm just going to ask you to come someplace, kneel down, bury your head in this place, and seek God until you're done. Would you do that for me tonight? Let's just call it a holy convocation. Come together and let's just seek the Lord. Pray for revival. Pray for healing. Pray for folks in our church who need a touch in their home. Financial needs met. Jobs. People that need a job. Let's pray for our people. Let's ask God. Let's pray for the Holy Ghost. Let's pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Let's pray for an outpouring of God's healing virtue that flows through every single one of our bodies.